speaker is Carrie Ann Hershen, and she is going to talk to us about an assessment of brook trout presence in the fish community composition in the headwater and tributaries of the East Branch of Solomon River, New York. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, my name is Carrie Hershen, and I'm studying uh, part time on my master's degree at SUNY SF under Dr. Neil Ringler and Dr. Margaret Murphy. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about today about brook trout um, and my research questions, some of the preliminary results that I've found, and some of the directions I'm taking um, next. So, as we all know, brook trout are one of two native salmonids in New York State, and they are their native range is from Maine to Georgia. The Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture started in 2006 and joined together as a group of um, state and federal wildlife agencies and nonprofits to determine the, the threats facing brook trout in their historic range to determine the extent of their current range and to, to think about a plan for their conservation. So this map is uh, one of the older maps before they finish the complete analysis of the distribution and it shows in the green areas it shows intact habitats, um, which have native um, wild reproduction in 50% or more of the sub watersheds, with reduced areas being wild reproduction in less than 50%. Uh, threats is identified by the brook trout, by the brook trout joint venture to brook trout across their range include habitat fragmentation with roads and culverts, uh, as well as warming water, um, creating unsuitable habitat, and uh, the presence of non-native species. In many places, these threats uh, compound to restrict brook trout out of their original habitat into, into more headwaters and more cold streams within their region. The uh, priorities for conservation as identified by the joint venture include conserving intact habitats, doing further analysis of existing stream populations and looking at changes in populations over time. Some strongholds for brook trout exist. Um, some of those are, include the Adirondack Park in New York State, as well as uh, many locations in Maine and New Hampshire. One of the watersheds uh, in the Adirondacks that has intact habitat in the east branch of it uh, is the El Sable River. This is in the northeastern part of the park, and uh, two branches flowing from the high peaks uh, of the Adirondack Mountains flow and meet together in a stable forks, and then flow north into Lake Champlain. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'll be talking about the upper east branch being from the headwaters, uh, the AMR, down to the town of Keene, and then the lower east branch being from Keene down towards Osceola Fork. This watershed, I'll also mention, has a lot of, there's a lot of conservation projects happening in it and a lot of um, culverts being replaced as a result of the Hurricane Irene, um, thinking about climate-ready culverts and fish passage throughout the watershed. Okay. <laughs> um, my project took me first to the headwaters of East Ridge. Um, which are located at the Adirondack Mountain Reserve, which is a private preserve owned and managed by the Al Sable Club in Keene Valley. And this is a 7,000 acre reserve um, that lies behind this gate uh, that is a conservation, one of the larger conservation easements in New York State and it offers hiking and access to some of the high peaks. Um, and the waters are managed for recreational fishing by the, the club members. This is a, a picture of lower Osable Lake with upper Osable Lake in the background, and the headwaters are here, Mount Marcy is back in the background there. Um, so the AMR has these two lakes and a number of tributaries that flow into them that, that form the headwaters of the Osable River. And just a side note that it's a rather remote study site that involves um, driving up a three mile dirt road, then rowing a guide boat up this lake, hiking another mile to get up to the upper lake. There. Pretty tough study. Um, there's been a lot of research in the watershed, and most of that's been focused recently at the uh, Adirondack Mountain Reserve, or AMR, as I'll continue to call it. Uh, 
in 2010, the, the club managers brought on a group of consulting biologists to look at the diminishing lake trout population and to look at the other fishing resources on the property. Um, so there have been water quality and fish surveys completed um, from 2010 through, through 2015 and the present. And the, these folks also looked at brook trout presence and absence in tributaries on the entire property in 2014. I'll be using a little, bit, a little bit of that data in a little bit. And then throughout the rest of the watershed, DEC Region 5 has done a number of you know, biological assessments on the tributaries throughout the rest of the system in the early 90s. And there's been a lot more work focused on some of the upper reaches of the tributaries that are um, off of the club, which all have healthy brook trout populations in the upper reaches. At the AMR, um, they've been doing uh, mandatory creel surveys of the anglers to track fishing pressure over time. And they also gave unique fin clips to all stock for trout, which is the only species stocked in the upper lake. Uh, and the anglers were educated to look for those fin clips and report them. And from the krill surveys and from the fish surveys that, that have been done, there's only been a few fish caught, and uh, clipped fish caught, which shows that there's likely uh, the wild population is dominating in the lake. Uh, as a result of this, they halted stocking in 2015. And some of the new research questions that have come out of come out of that is how to further document the use of streams by brook trout, um, and to see whether natural reproduction is occurring in the lake or in the tributaries that, that attach to the upper Osceola Lake, uh, as well as trying to estimate the population size of the lake. And all this and my research and my literature reviews have also led me to wonder where brook trout are in relation to the river throughout the rest of the watershed from the headwaters to the mouth. So I've done um, a lot of surveys. I did uh, trap net surveys using modified Oneida trap, hoop style trap nets um, and a market capture study last uh, May and October. I'll show you some results from that as well as um, some habitat surveys where I collected lots of widths and depths um, every five meters on uh, a number of these streams. And I did backpack electric fishing surveys, multiple paths. Um, on four tributaries at the Adirondack Mountain Reserve, and 17 additional tributaries on the length of the Lower East Branch. This is a map of the Upper East Branch, with Upper Alsable Lake right here, and that's Lower Alsable Lake. The purple streams are those that I surveyed, and the green ones were included in that brook trout presence and absence study. Uh, the tributaries were very different. Some of them were big and some of them were little. This was less than a meter wide and it was an intermittent stream, but it held lots of little brook trout. Uh, and this other brook, Crystal Brook, um, at the upper lake was five meters wide. So I surveyed from the mouth to the first upstream barrier, which in some cases was that waterfall and in other cases was bedrock falling off a cliff um, at 100 meters upstream from the lake. Uh, and then the trap net surveys were done at these sites, at site three, two, four, one, and six. Um, these sites were identified by the biologists that worked uh, there in the past uh, based on where they've seen brook trout reds, areas of spawning activity, and also near the bottom of my study stream. Here's, some, uh, here's the table of all the fish that we caught and processed in May and October of last year. We caught 67 brook trout in May and an additional 21 in October with a very low recapture rate. Um, our capture unit effort um, in May was 17.5 uh, fish per net set, there were 48 hour net sets, um, and seven fish per net set in October. We also caught a number of other species, all native to New York State, with the exception of the single rainbow trout that we think might have come, worked its way up the river um, downstream. Uh, with a, a great deal of lake chub and common shiner, white sucker, and pumpkin seed. So next, I went downstream and focused on these other 17 additional tributaries that are marked in purple. Um, there's fit, about 50 streams total, so the, the survey that I'm going to talk to you about encompasses uh, almost two-thirds of those. Uh, this is... <coughs> A rather big chart, but it shows the fish um, community composition going from 
uh, upstream sites at the headwaters on the left, going all the way downstream towards Osceola Forks. Uh, the with that restriction in the, the lower and upper here. And uh, the main thing to note is that you know the presence of brook trout in the upper reaches in making up most of the samples, along with slime sculpin and longnose days, flatnose days, and that's trans forming into a different sort of community as you go downstream and you see other trout species coming in. Uh, this one pulls apart just and looks just at the trout species um, alone, but the same but the same at the headwaters, down towards Osceola Parks, and you see brook trout in most of the upstream sites. These sites had no trout, the sites without bars, and you see um, rainbow and brown trout coming in to dominate the sample. These surveys, again, were just um, from the mouth to the first barrier. Um, so, so near the near the river itself. This table just summarizes all of the streams, including the 2014 data of whether brook trout were present or absent in, in the mouths of these streams, and looks at species richness, which ranges from one to four species per sample uh, in the headwaters, down to you know between six and eleven towards the headwaters. So the diversity increases as you go downstream, looking at these tributaries. Uh, next, I just wanted to, I thought it was pretty interesting, I wanted to present my data uh, analysis looking at the DEC surveys from the 1990s. This is data from the statewide um, DEC database, uh, and, as well as my surveys. And I matched up the, the survey sites, I, so I don't have data for all my streams because I'm trying to match up the survey sites closest to the, that were at the mouth or within uh, less than a thousand meters from the mouth. <coughs> and I've highlighted in yellow the, the interesting findings um, the absence of brook trout in John's brook. This is upstream again, downstream up here. Uh, brook, brown, and rainbow trout were all caught in dark brook in 1992, and I didn't find any in 2016, as hard as I tried. Um, a number of other species there as well. At Cascade Brook, uh, we went from brook trout and rainbow trout in 1995 to a uh, brown trout dominated stream in 2016. Um, and I also want to note that this is possibly the farthest upstream um, occurrence of fantail dart that's been recorded in the watershed. At Stiles Brook, we've got three samples to look at, and that includes um, brown trout in 1990 to all species in 92, and then um, no species uh, of trout in 2016, so a little bit of community change elsewhere. This stream was extremely impacted by um, Hurricane Irene, uh, so it's important some of the upstream regions were, were completely devastated and that might be in there. Otis Brook, uh, again the absence of trout, but then you see an uh, almost complete shift um, in the other species found here at this site. So um, there's a marked shift in community composition over the, the past two decades in these streams. Um, it's really interesting to think about, and I'd like to um, follow up, and some of my next steps include looking at land use, to wonder if land use changes at play. The headwaters here are completely preserved, and you go downstream, you get a lot of residential housing, as well as um, some more state forest in the upstream reaches, and then um, logging in, in a few places as well. <clears throat> and it's possible that all of those threats I was discussing at the beginning could be compounding to, um, to change the community composition over time. Um, but it is important to note that, that beyond this, the brook trout were present in two-thirds of all the streams, from the, from the headwaters to the mouth. And I think this watershed can still be considered intact. Um, it'd be great to go back and look at some of the other upstream DEC sites, the same sites, and look at a comparison of those. Uh, I also think it's really important to understand if and how brook trout are using the, the actual the East Branch of Sable River itself and whether they're using the tributaries for thermal refuge or for feeding. Um, and this baseline data will aid in conservation efforts and help guide um, future culvert replacements and fish passage in the future. So I'm going to look at some more historic data analysis next. Um, as well as the land use survey that I mentioned, I'm going to try to take all the hours and hours of habitat surveys that I did and um, incorporate them and try to apply a habitat suitability index to this watershed. And I'd like to do some statistical analysis between the presence of brook trout in these <coughs> streams and some of the physical and water quality data that I recorded. 
And it'd be great to think about um, the use of other features like environmental DNA to uh, map the extent of brook trout in the rest of these streams and, and in the river itself across the watershed. Definitely a bit cooler 